Restaurant Unstoppable. Inspire, empower, and transform the industry. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, founder of the National Center for Employee Ownership, Corey Rosen. Corey, my man, are you feeling unstoppable today? I'm ready. Yeah, so we have to get the ball rolling with a success quote or mantra. What do you got for us? Well, <clears throat> employee ownership is a way to make capitalism work for everybody. And it is one of the few things that deals with the current economic situation in the US and indeed around the world that has been strongly endorsed by liberals by conservatives, by Republicans, by Democrats. Uh, as a friend of mine once said, and, and maybe this is a reference for only some of the older of you, it's the only three thing that the three Jesses ever agreed on. Jesse Ventura, Jesse Jackson, and Jesse Helms. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a great way to get this thing started. And it's not every day. And like right now in a world that has never been more divided because of just I mean, we don't need to get into that subject of echo chambers and people just at each other's throats. It's good to find some commonality and it's good to find something that we can all agree on. And I'm, I'm, I'm really excited that you chose to start today's conversation uh, around that, that, that topic of, we can all agree on that. This is equity for everybody is a good thing, right? Right. Right. And when we think about the economy today, over the last now 50 years, so going back to the 1970s, if your primary source of financial security is your job, which of course it is for most people, yeah. your real wages are almost identical to what they were 50 years ago. Now, during that time, the productivity of labor has gone up substantially because of technology and machinery and all sorts of other things. And normally that increase in productivity gets paid for by better wages for people. But that didn't happen. In fact, it's been captured entirely by the owners of these technologies and these machines and capital and so on. So, if you were a worker in 1970 and you continued for the next 50 years, your wages would basically be stagnant in real dollars. But if you were an owner in 1970, the value of your ownership in real dollars is about 900% of what it was then. So that's led to a tremendous concentration of wealth amongst a very small number of people. And that creates a lot of difficulties in society because you have a lot of people who are severely economically insecure. You know, people have probably seen these surveys saying that most of the population couldn't afford to pay for a $400 emergency. Some studies say a $1,000 emergency if that happened. They don't have the available assets to do that. Uh, most people don't have adequate funds to retire on, and that's gonna be a real crisis as people get older. So this creates lots of problems, not the least of which is for restaurants who'd like to have those people be customers. Yeah, I mean, I think rest, the restaurant industry is absolutely one of these companies that you're kind of identifying right now, or this one of those industries. I think what you're saying strikes especially true for the restaurant industry, where uh, the, the distribution of wealth, uh, not even between employees and ownership, but even between front of house and back of house, is in equal or not right right you know, so like um actually the reason why you're here today is because uh one of the questions i'm going to be asking my guests going forward is what's wrong with our industry and how are we going to change this right so i was actually speaking to patrick whalen from five street group uh based out of I believe charlotte or they're all throughout the, the southeast and when i asked him that question he said there's a huge issue with a wage inequality in our industry, like, uh, or especially between front of house and back house, but just generally speaking, we've been doing business the same way for over a hundred years. We haven't evolved our way of doing business. And this feeds into exactly what you're saying is as 
efficiency is approved, uh, the people at the top got, you know, more money, but the people at the bottom are still scraping to get by. Uh, like there's in our industry, you see everywhere there's uh, funds for taking care of people who are sick because they can't afford to take care of themselves. So like, instead of just creating funds to take care of people, why not just pay people more money, you know, give them assets beyond a paycheck. Yeah, of course, that's that's the, the trick there, as you said, more money, give them assets, is where's that balance? So, you know, restaurants are a tough business uh, to make money in. And so you have to be sympathetic to people who who own a restaurant, especially smaller, uh, smaller restaurants and small chains of restaurants. My dad owned a delicatessen when I was growing up or a small delicatessen. And, you know, he worked 12 hours a day every day. And it was it was hard just to break even. So I really uh, sympathize and understand with uh, the issues that how difficult this industry can be. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the one of the questions then is, well, if it's if it's difficult to pay our people enough to prevent them from go taking a job at Amazon or something, what else is available to attract and retain people and give them some kind of economic future? And that other alternative is, what if they also were owners of this enterprise? And so they had a stake in its future and that both can pay off for them, but it can also pay off for the restaurant if people are owners and act that way. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to getting into that win-win situation where why restaurant owners win when we take this approach and why the employee wins when we take this approach. But I kind of want to let our listeners know a little bit more about who you are, why we should be listening to you, why you are somebody who knows a lot about this subject, and then maybe get more into the specifics of, of what an ESOP is. Sure. So I'm the, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm the founder of the National Center for Employee Ownership. We are a nonprofit organization. We actually now have staff all over the country as we've become a virtual organization. And our mission in life is to help employee ownership thrive by providing really objective, accurate information about this topic. We're not a consulting company. We're not a lobbying organization. Our focus is on providing really good information to people about the various ways that you can share ownership with employees. And there are different ways to do it. And I think, I think especially in the restaurant industry, the variety of approaches is important because some kinds of approaches are going to work for some kinds of restaurants and others approaches will work better for different kinds of restaurants. I've got to interject because I've been one of the biggest lessons I've learned in almost a thousand episodes is there is no one way, regardless of the business model. And I think we're always searching for the secret sauce, the, the, the formula, the step-by-step -step process too. And I think it's really important for people to understand that there's no two businesses that are exactly the same. Right. And what was step-by-step -step for one company might not be step-by-step -step for you. So thank you for reinforcing that lesson. So companies who want to find out more about employee ownership, we're a great place to do that. And uh, our website's N NCEO, uh, our initials, National Center for Employee Ownership, nceo.org. Uh, if you just Google employee ownership, you'll probably find us anyway. Yeah. So what were you doing before you founded this? It was 1980 when you founded this, correct? That's correct. So it's been a long time. So this is our 41st year now. And what was it that uh, I, made you want to start this? Like, was there, what was your influence for doing this? Well, I started out as an academic. Uh, I was teaching government in college. Then I ended up uh, going from there to working on Capitol Hill, on eventually the Senate Small Business Committee staff. I learned about employee ownership and was really intrigued because when I first read about it, I thought, well, here's an idea that can help create a more equitable economy, but does it in a way that 
the people who currently are owners, the people who run companies, would find appealing. That's in their interest too. So it's a win for everybody. And it was this very, even then, peculiar thing where Republicans and Democrats both agreed it was a really good idea. <clears throat> so I thought, here's a politically practical idea that can have significant economic impact and that is driven not by altruism, although occasionally it is, but by shared mutual economic interest. And that's a much more effective way to create change. Employee ownership done well improves the benefits to current owners, it improves the performance of the company, and it improves the lives of workers. And that's a win-win you don't see very often. Yeah, and and I hope to unpackage exactly how, like, what the benefits are, uh, what the there there are some challenges associated with this too that you covered. Yes. Should say you're you know we we mentioned that you're the founder of the National Center of Employee Ownership. You're also the author of Equity: Why Employee Why Employee Ownership is Good for Businesses, which is what I read to prepare for today's conversation. And you have another book coming out next year, Ownership, uh, Reinventing Companies, Capitalism, and Who Owns What. So we're talking to the right person. Uh, and I really did enjoy this book, by the way. There's there's a whole history on ESOPs and where right. it's involved over time, which I thought was fascinating as well. Um, and I wasn't expecting that history lesson. The first you know, third of the book, I feel like, is just a history on ESOPs. So what is ESOP? What does that even mean? Like, what is an ESOP? So there are a variety of ways that you can share ownership with employees, and we should talk about the different ways. But in the U.S., the by far most tax-favored way, and as a result, the most common way for employees to be owners is through an employee stock ownership plan. And ESOP is a specific statutory term. It's not a generic term for any kind of employee ownership. So the idea for ESOPs really got started in the 1950s when a San Francisco lawyer named Louis Kelso was thinking about what was gonna to happen to the economy going forward. And he said, what he envisioned was that wages would stagnate and returns to capital investment would soar. And at the time, that was considered really wacko. Even until the 70s, it was still considered really wacko. Uh, he was on 60 Minutes in 1974. And Paul Samuelson, the most famous economist at the time, uh, said that Lewis Kelso was basically just a kook. He wasn't even an economist. So why should we listen to him? And what he was saying was totally wrong. Uh, of course, Paul Samuelson's no longer with us, but I wish he were so he could go back and look at Eat 60 those words. minutes and see, <laughs> uh -huh, what he predicted is exactly what happened and what you predicted is exactly what didn't. But Kelso said, so how are we going to solve this problem so that ordinary working people can become owners too? Well, traditionally, the answer would be, well, save your money and go buy stocks in the stock market or maybe even start your own company. Well, that's great if you have the money to do that, but if your wages are in real dollars stagnating while your needs for things like increasingly expensive healthcare and education are increasing, then where's that money gonna come from? So Kelso's answer was somehow companies have to decide that it's in their interest to share ownership with employees. That it would, in other words, these funds, these plans would be funded by the company, not by the employee. Yes. Ownership would become a benefit of working for the company. Yes, I, I wanted to step in really quick because what you're sharing right now, by far, one of the, the commonalities between the restaurant tours that I've interviewed, what makes them successful is they realize that their job is to create opportunity for others and to empower others and they recreate themselves and others. And that's what that's why they have so much opportunity, because it's not about me becoming successful. It's about me making sure everyone around me becomes successful and in doing that. I do also become successful. I never had right. the, the framing 
to, to figure out exactly how to do that until I, I started reading your book where I'm, you know, where in my mind before it was just like investing, you, you bring somebody up, you teach them your culture, you teach them the systems and processes you have to run your business. And then you say, what, what's your vision for your business? What do you want to do and how can we help you? But this is even, I feel like this, this approach of an ESOP gives opportunity bef- even before that point. Yeah. So the way, so what Kelso said, decided was that if this is going to happen, we've got to give owners an economic incentive to do this. And the best way to do this is through tax incentives. And in 1974, uh, working with the then most powerful member of the Senate, Russell Long, who was chairman of the tax writing committee in the Senate, the Senate Finance Committee, Senator Long was totally enhanced, uh, totally uh, embraced this notion. He just thought, this is fabulous. Uh, Russell Long's father was Huey Long. Huey Long was a famous uh, and somewhat sketchy character in the Depression, governor of Louisiana, U.S. Senator, ran for president on the platform of every man a king. Uh, Also a pretty corrupt guy. (laughs) Uh, And he was going to tax the rich and give it to the poor. Russell was a lot more conservative. I did get Uh, quite a lot of opportunity to get to know him and work with him when I worked in the Senate. And his view was that ESOPs were were, were Huey Long without the Robin Hood, that they weren't taking any money from rich people to give to people who weren't. They were actually giving incentives to people with assets to share some of those assets with employees. So Congress created this law that puts ESOPs into the general framework of retirement plans in the US. So think profit sharing plans, 401k plans, plans like that, where the company sets up a trust. You know, if you have a 401k plan, it operates through a trust that holds the assets for employees. And in a 401k plan, often the company will make some contribution to the trust and it gets a tax deduction for that. Well, in ESOP's the same idea, except the employees don't put anything in. The company makes a contribution to the trust and it can either contribute shares. So it can just issue more shares and put these into the trust so that now the employees own a piece and the existing owners own somewhat less. But much more commonly what happens is that the company puts cash into the trust and then that cash can be used to buy shares from owners who are looking to sell. And if you wanna do this more quickly, which most companies do, the trust can actually borrow money can borrow from a bank, it can borrow from the seller, can take a seller note saying, pay me back over some number of years. So the trust takes this loan, let's say it's $2 million, and it takes that $2 million and it purchases stock from people who want to sell. Now, normally when you use company money, to buy out an owner, you don't get a tax deduction for that. But with an ESOP, you do. So let's say that Mary has a $2 million interest in a restaurant and she's ready to move on and she doesn't wanna sell that to another company uh, or maybe she's got a partner and the partner doesn't have $2 million. And so instead Mary says, well, let's create one of these ESOPs. And the ESOP will borrow the $2 million and it will buy my shares. And the company will fund that by making contributions to this trust out of the future profits that these employee owners will help create. Now, normally, if the company just took $2 million to buy Mary's shares, that's called a redemption, the company would first have to earn about $3.3 million 
to have enough money after paying taxes on those profits to buy Mary out. But with an ESOP, it only needs $2 million. So that's the first big tax advantage. And the second is that if the company is organized as a C corporation or becomes one, then Mary can take the gain she made from this sale, reinvest it in stocks and bonds of other companies and not pay any tax until she sells those. So let me give you an example. There's a chain of pizza restaurants in Louisiana mostly, but some in Arkansas and Mississippi called Johnny's Pizza House. And they have now 39 locations. And in 2000, Johnny, the owner, was thinking about gradually starting to sell. And he could have sold it to some other company, maybe even a private equity firm, not, not so much back then, but probably now. But it just didn't feel right to him. He just didn't like that idea for a lot of reasons. One of which is he wasn't ready to sell everything now. He just wanted to sell part of it now. And then he could see what he wanted to do later. And if he sold it to one of these other buyers and he would be gone. So instead he said, well, you know, I found this ESOP thing. Maybe that would work. So they set up an ESOP and it bought part of his stock. And over the ensuing years, it would buy additional amounts of his stock. And in 2018, they became 100% employee owned. Now that's an interesting phenomenon too, because under the tax law, if you're 100% owned by your employees, you don't pay any income tax. The company pays no state or federal income tax. That's a good thing. And that's not a loophole, that's the law. And according to the current CEO of Johnny's, Melvin De La Cerda, uh, they are writing for employees who leave the company six and even seven figure checks. That's crazy. For their ownership. They've done so well. So people who are, you know, an assistant manager at a pizza restaurant are leaving with six and sometimes seven figure amounts. And the company obviously is doing really well. So they're really excited about it. So are there any elements of what an ESOP is that you haven't gone out yet before we start to kind of dive into? Yeah, so, so, the, so the, it's important to understand some of the rules here that there are these tremendous tax benefits for this. There's considerable flexibility in how much the ESOP can own 5% or 50% or 100%. Uh, there, there's some different tax benefits for C and S corporations. So I'm not sure how much you want to get into the weeds on those things. Yeah, I don't think we but, need to get into details of that, but I think it would be cool. I would love to go deeper in a different day to like really kind of granularly unpack yeah. what the options are. Uh, but, one but I think it's important to understand what the rules for ownership are because please that that's that's what both makes this work and for some companies makes it not work uh, so the rule is this is a like other retirement type plans that although you get the money when when you leave as we'll see but the company can't pick and choose who's going to be an owner and it can't pick and choose who's going to get how much the way this law works is that every employee who's worked at least a thousand hours in a year has to be eligible to participate in the plan. Now you can make that less. Johnny says 800 hours because they want to include more people. But at least everybody who's worked a thousand hours in a year has to be in the plan. And then the stock that's held in the trust that gets allocated to accounts for individual employees. And that's based on their relative pay or a more level formula. You can't do it based on discretion or some other non-formula basis. It has to be based on level, on a relative pay or a more level formula. Then, an, so an employee gets some shares in his or her account but they're not theirs right away. You have to vest 
in these benefits. So you can vest over as long as six years over in a graduated way. So if you have employees, as of course restaurants often do, who work for six months or a year or whatever and go do something else, those people wouldn't be included. You could theoretically include them, but it would be unusual. This is really is aimed at the people who stick around with you for at least a couple of years. Those are the people who are gonna get the benefit and they probably have to work five or six years to become 100% vested. Yeah, and I think that's a huge, a huge uh, aspect of why this is so effective. One of the biggest challenges, especially in the restaurant industry, is uh, employee turnover, right? right? So giving them an incentive and saying, you need to be here for at least five years to be able to get access to this, this money you've earned over the time you've been here, like that, to, to make that a milestone and to make that contingent on you getting the money or having access to that. Maybe, I, did I hear that correctly? That like you're, you're accruing, uh, profit during the first five years, but you don't get it unless you stick around. Well, the vesting schedule is that you have to start vesting at at least 20% after two years. And then it can be 20% more per year till you're hundred percent vested after six. You can vest people faster if you want, but once you're fully vested, doesn't mean you're going to get your money yet. Yeah. You don't get your money until you leave. And even then it depends on whether you leave because of death, retirement, or disability, or for some other reason. And if you leave for some other reason, say you leave when you're 45, the company doesn't have to start making distributions to you for five years. So there's, there's some flexibility in when you start paying people. A lot of companies would pay out sooner, but they don't have to. So, so Mary gets her shares at 45 when she's left. And now the company has to buy them back. So she's not just getting worthless pieces of paper. And it's really important to understand that every transaction in an ESOP, every time the, the company has the ESOP buy shares, it's based on an annual appraisal by an independent outside appraisal firm. Yeah, so um, I think we unpackaged the most of the what or how an ESOP works, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. The one last thing, because this is really critical, these are not cheap. Uh, the, the cost of setting one of these up is, depending on the size and complexity of the company, uh, $100,000 up to a few hundred thousand dollars. Is it because so, of like lawyer fees? Yeah, or there's lawyers and trustees and valuation firms. It's a lot less expensive than the cost of selling your business to someone else. But if you're not a consistently profitable company with enough money to finance your operations and to buy the stock and to take advantage of the tax benefits, and you probably need at least 20 to 30 employees so that you're big enough to absorb these costs, then an ESOP really is not the right approach. There are other ways to share ownership that may be really effective for you and we can talk about those yeah. later if you like because I, I, I have, yeah, I do have questions on. about that um that i was going to save to the very end because um we don't need to get into that now uh one one thing that i kind of found ironic was that a big reason why esops were created back during the industrial revolution was a, a fear of loss of jobs to automation right sounds very similar to a current s scenario that's going on right now right. where with AI and robotics on the rise uh, and just the, the not just the, the digital presence of streamlining process through digital capabilities, I see a future where we're going to be able to run restaurants and much fewer individuals. Uh, and then my thought behind that is if, if you can run a restaurant with 10 people and lean on automation and outsourcing, then what's keeping you from making everybody who's there who has a specific role and responsibility in owner and, distrib and distribute the wealth equally. Um, right. Maybe we sit on that question till later, but do you want to get into that now? Well, I think this is an issue, not just for the restaurant industry, but for a lot of industries that wealth 
increasingly is a function of ownership. And of course, it's always been predicted that whatever the latest industrial revolution, technology revolution, robotics revolution or whatever, will ultimately reduce the amount of work that needs to be done. And then that doesn't happen. Although I think there's more reason to believe it might now. But in any event, at least work shifts. And the value that's being created increasingly is being created by this technology and machinery. And so if employees don't have access to some of that wealth, uh, they're gonna be in tough shape. So certainly you can imagine in the restaurant industry if this sort of thing happens, that there would be a couple of options. One is of course, to make people owners and reduce the amount of staff that you have. The other might be to use the savings from the robotics to add additional restaurants or to add additional responsibilities for employees who now don't have to wash the dishes or prepare the hamburgers because some robotics machine does that. Maybe they can be enhancing the customer experience in other ways. That's worth it. Do you see a model where like you have, so say you have a restaurant group, right? And you have individuals who fall into certain lanes. You have your executive chef, you have your operations person, the person who's you know, savvy in all the technology that's happening. You have your marketing person and maybe you have your HR person, or maybe you don't need HR because everybody's an owner, right? Um, Who knows? Maybe you you, you still do because there's still employees and there's still rules. But now you have these five people, right? Whatever five people you think you need and they all have their own lane and they be, they do, they stay in their lane for every concept that you have. And then you lean more on automation and streamlining process, maybe doing one thing really well, which is a trend that's happening in the restaurant industry, like we just sell pizza or we just do tacos or we just do burritos and you streamline a process for better throughput. And then you just, for every menu item, you create a whole new concept around it, right? And each person is in their lane for each concept. Mm-hmm. Of the business. That's kind of the, the future I see happening. Uh, I don't know. Do you see that as being a possibility as a, a like a, a realistic future? Well, you guys know a lot more about the restaurant industry than I do. I'm a student, man. I'm, I'm here to learn. So I, I don't know. I can't. I don't want to speak about the future of the restaurant industry because uh, what I'm you just, know about economics. I'm definitely not an expert on that. But what you as far I mean, do, do I sound like a crazy person? Are you just trying to? Be Absolutely nice? not. No, I mean <laughs> the, the same concept applies to all sorts of businesses, where you may see a shift from people doing jobs that are now fairly routine, saying, "Well, if we don't." need people to do their routine jobs either we don't do those jobs at all now or maybe there are other things that people uniquely can do to enhance our product our service our customer relations or whatever yeah i think it just frees us up i mean when you know when i started this organization uh we had typewriters And if we did a mailing, I put things in order by zip code. And then we got computers. And so increasingly tasks that took forever to do by hand could be done by computers. That didn't decrease the opportunity to hire people. It increased it because now we we had efficiencies doing those things that essentially freed up money to go do other things and so create more opportunity yeah as as more as more of the routine work got handled by computers and technology that enabled that was essential to enable us to grow the number of people that we have to do other things we're back and before we start to unpackage the benefits of an esop uh and the the common challenges of ESOPs. Uh, I'm really curious because you you mentioned something that I think is kind of an issue, kind of messed up, if I'm being honest. Do you think it's a problem that uh, there's such a high bar to get over $100,000 to cover the legal expenses to set this up that more people would do this 
the right thing, the ethical thing, if they had the means to do it? Is that an, an inherent issue right there? It is, but I think it's to some extent an unavoidable issue. When you have a substantial tax benefit and ESOPs are enormously tax favored, I mean, there is no other way to sell your business that comes even close to the tax benefits that are provided by ESOPs. You know, defer your capital gains, maybe avoid paying capital gains altogether, use pre-tax money to buy the shares, be able to, to leave the company on your own terms. You can stay as long as you want to stay. I should mention that although the employees are owners, the legal owner is the trust. And so the governance of the company doesn't really change unless you want it to. The employees aren't going to be telling you what to do. So all these tremendous benefits. And then once you become employee-owned, if you're fully employee-owned, you don't pay any income tax. All those benefits could be incredibly alluring to people who just want to get the tax benefits, but don't particularly like the rules. And so you have to have rules, you have to have enforcement. And that requires a number of steps in, in things like, well, you have to have a lawyer design the plan. You have to have a valuation firm do a valuation every year. You need a trustee to oversee the process of the purchase and make sure that that's done up appropriately. If you're borrowing money from banks, as often is the case with these transactions, the banks have fees. So there's, there's rules, there's risks. I wish that the providers would charge less money than they do, but, but that's just the reality. We'd love to see these costs be lower, but uh, they probably can't be dramatically lower given the amount of work that needs to be done. As I said, there are alternatives to ESOPs if they're too complicated, too burdensome, or you just don't like the rules that are considerably less expensive. They just don't have all the same tax yeah. benefits. So, I mean, that I, I would love to see a future of restaurant industry where it's just a bunch of owners and people spreading the wealth out evenly. Like I would love to see that future. Um, so maybe that future is on a different framing. That's not an ESOP. If you, cause what's stopping people from starting from day one as an employee owned organization where. Yeah. Like, well, why, nothing. It's I mean, not an option. You just wouldn't be an ESOP to do it, but there are lots of different ways to do that. For instance, in the restaurant industry, there's probably a couple hundred worker cooperatives. So here where I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, some of the most iconic uh, bakeries here are the Arismendi bakeries. Uh, in Berkeley, most famously the Cheese Board. And these, this is a group of worker cooperative businesses. So worker cooperatives, are often startups where a group of employees say, let's start a restaurant. And in the case of the Ars Mendy ones, it's a, it's a place where you can go get baked goods, sandwiches, and particularly famous pizza. And so those employees all agree to put in some relatively small amount of capital to try to get the thing going. And each of them is an owner. Each of them is considered an owner. And as they bring in new people, that group of employees can vote to include those new people as owners or not. And then those new people would pay a, a fee to join the worker cooperative. So over time, these cooperatives might grow from several to you know, 15, 20, 30 employees. Uh, so so that's, a, that's an approach that can be quite effective. And in a number of cities now, there are programs where the city can help employees actually start a worker co-op like that. 
Or if you've got a really small restaurant with just a handful of employees and the owner wants the employees to become new owners, but an ESOP's too expensive and complicated, then you could sell to a worker cooperative. Now you probably can't sell for a great deal of money because they don't have a great deal of money, but you can sell for something and maybe a share of the profits going forward. Uh, but you also get to whatever gain that you make, just like with ESOPs, you can defer taxes on that. I was going to ask what the, the tax benefits were to a Yeah, they're, they're not as great as an ESOP, but you can defer the tax benefits and the company can deduct. In, in most cooperatives, the way they work is that the employees get a share of the profits each year. Yeah. They, they don't actually own the shares, which tend not to be worth a lot over time anyway, but they do get a share of the profits based on their ownership, and that's deductible for the company. Uh, so that's one way to do it. Another way to do it that's even more flexible is a lot of restaurants start as limited liability corporations, and you can give any individual employee based on whatever rule you like. So you could give it to one or to everybody. You can give them what's called synthetic equity. You can give them literal ownership as well. But in my conversations with people in this situation, there's usually not a lot of advantage of that in, in that. And it goes into tax issues I won't go into. But what synthetic equity is, is it's saying to people, I'm going to give you the right to the value of a percentage of the ownership of the company. You're not actually going to get literal ownership because what really you interests you is the money. Can you, can you repeat that line one more time for me? Yeah. So what I'm going to do is give you the right to the value of a percentage of ownership of the company, or I can give you the right to the increase in the value of a percentage of the company. So I can say, well, I'm going to give you the equivalent of 2% of, of the company. And when you leave or at any point you decide you want to do this, I'm going to write you a check for what that now is worth. So if 2% was worth $10,000 uh, at the outset, and maybe five years later, it's worth $20,000, I write you a check for $20,000. Alternatively, I could say I'm going to give you the right to the increase in the value of that $10,000. So in that case, I'd give you $10,000. So you can do either one. You can create whatever rules you want about who gets how much, when they get it, uh, how long it will take them to vest, to earn this. So it's extremely flexible. It's not very expensive to set up. And for a small company, particularly a younger company without a lot of profits at that point, this can be a very attractive way where you say, well, you know, I, I really need to attract and retain people in these positions. This is a way to do that. Uh, yeah. it doesn't um, have it doesn't have the powerful tax benefits that these other plans do. It's taxed in much the same way that a bonus would be taxed. Got it. So this is under the LLC approach that you're describing to us and this synthetic. That's method. right. Um, can you think just while it's on my mind of somebody who can speak really well to this approach for the LLC approach with the synthetic equity? No, I know a lot about this. Yeah. Oh, maybe you can come back and go even further, but I'm trying to find it. If there's anybody that you can think of, that's like a, like the, the industry expert on this, or even like restaurant tours who, who do this really well, in your opinion, I'd love to. Yeah. To, I don't to, know restaurants who do this. You, the, and the experts that you get, this is much, this is a common thing in uh, startup technology companies. So well, restaurants they're, don't they're, do they're in a very different kind. Our of head is always down. We don't share knowledge. We don't share that this is even a yeah. possibility. That's a, one of the biggest issues with our industry is we're so close to the chest with our information because we want a competitive edge. Yeah. So I'm trying to break that by making. Yeah, I, I definitely know people who do this sort of who 
who are consultants in this space. I, one in particular would be great. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like whether you are a co-op, whether you are a workers cooperative, whether you are an LLC with synthetic equity, the 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 best practices and how to run an ownership company are still the same as far as yeah concepts like how to treat people like we're going to get into that next yes. but before that we is. get into that i'm really really curious at what point does it make sense to go from maybe a workers cooperative to a esop is there a, a place in yeah the so so I, I think there's a few criteria before a company should think about itself as eligible for an esop the first is um, you you do need uh, hundred thousand twenty or thirty employees yeah. and a hundred thousand dollars. You need right. You need enough profit so that you can afford the initial cost. You, if you are the seller and you are leaving, this is only going to work if you've got successor management who can run the company well to make sure they continue to make money. Uh, and you need enough profits going forward so that you can both pay for the cost of setting the thing up. And the costs on an ongoing basis are vastly less, not really an issue at all. You see this cost coming down as more and more people get involved and more lawyers. No, specialize? no. Uh, and, and then so and then the last thing is you need enough money to buy out your shares and still run your business successfully. So you need all those things in place to be a good candidate for an ESOP. I think people shouldn't get too tied up in knots about the initial cost if they meet those criteria, because if what they're doing is saying, well, like the owner of Johnny's, I could sell to somebody else or I could sell to an ESOP. And if I sell to somebody else, I'm going to need lawyers. I'm going to need an accountant. I'm probably going to need an appraisal. I'm going to have contingencies on the sale that I won't have with an ESOP. Most of the sales will have requirements like you have to have a certain amount of sales or we're going to take some of the money back or part of what we pay you is going to be based on the profits that the company makes. So those contingencies won't exist in an ESOP. Uh, and then the other side's going to have all of its fees. And you're also probably going to have a broker to try to find a buyer. And the broker is going to charge you a percentage of the transaction. So the transaction cost of selling to someone else uh, may be two or three times as high as the cost of selling to an ESOP. And they're equally or more complicated. So it's just a fact of life that selling a business is expensive and complicated. Yeah. And so the cost per se is more an issue of are you big enough to even be in that ballpark so you can afford it? But if you meet all those criteria, then an ESOP really is something you should look at. Yeah. So I want to cover at least two or three things before we wrap up today. I, I want to know what the specific benefits of an ESOP are. What are the commonalities between ESOPs that are successful? And what are the commonalities between ESOPs or any kind of, I'm saying ESOP, but at this point I'm generalizing to owner organizations, yeah. employee owned organizations. So what are the benefits of an employee owner uh organization uh what are the commonalities between the ones that are doing it well and what are the commonalities between the ones that aren't doing it well yeah so just to recap the benefits of of an of specifically an esop tax deductible dollars to buy out owners if you're an s corporation or convert to it you don't have to pay any income tax on the amount of profits attributable to the ownership of the esop so 100% is no tax, 50% is 50% of the tax. The employees aren't taxed on what they get until they eventually take the money out and spend it. Um, the seller can get a capital gains deferral by selling to an ESOP. That's also true if they sell to a worker cooperative and the money that's used to buy the seller is tax deductible. So, and it's very flexible. You can sell some or all of the company over whatever period you like. So those are the common tax benefits. 
we also know that these companies tend to perform better. So if we look at the data, and now there's 40 years of research on this, if we look at the data, some really striking findings have come out from academia and from the NCEO. And I think one, and you can, you can go to a site, just ownershipeconomy.org, ownershipeconomy.org. And this is especially important, I think, for restaurants. It's a study of how millennials do who work for ESOP companies. They get higher wages. They have a great deal more job security. They have greater wealth. They have greater benefits than millennials who don't work for ESOPs. Overall, people who work for ESOPs end up, uh, they're not all doing as well as Johnny's <laughs> employees, yeah. but overall they end up with about two and a half times the retirement assets of employees who are fortunate enough to be in any retirement plan. They get paid somewhat better. They get laid off at one third to one fifth the rate of other companies. And companies grow about two and a half percent per year faster than would have been expected if they didn't have an employee ownership plan. So really impressive benefits in terms of the performance for the companies and the performance for employees. And all these greater benefits for employees effectively are being paid for then by the improved performance of the companies. But that performance is contingent on doing certain things in the company. Yes. And that's what we're going to get into next. But before we get into those, I think, I think there's probably more things that you have to do consistently than there are things that you, the list of things that you don't want to do is I think is shorter. So let's start with the list of things you don't want to do. Like, and like, just what is like, what is the commonality between ESOPs or employee owned operations that don't work? Why don't yeah. they? So I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Beyond Engagement, How to Make Your Business into an Idea Factory. And the first line of that book is it's simple. The best companies are ones that generate the most ideas from the most people about the most things. And it really is that simple. That is the golden rule of running a business well. There is a perception that whether it's employee ownership or not, that what really makes a difference is if employees feel engaged, and that's why I use the term beyond engagement. If employees feel engaged, they'll work harder and care more and the company will make more money. Well, if you do the math on this, it turns out that makes a little bit of difference, positive difference, but nothing like what going beyond engagement, actually getting employees involved in sharing ideas, identifying problems and coming up with solutions does. So yesterday I was watching the Golden State Warriors basketball game. I was really engaged in watching them play that game, but I wasn't involved. It, I really didn't make any difference at all to whether they won or lost, no matter how engaged I was. In companies, it can be the same thing. So if you're in a restaurant, you may have employees who are enthused, uh, but there's some problem that they're having with customers. There's some barrier to customers buying an extra dessert or whatever, or the customer tells them, you know, this is terrible and I'm not coming back here. And, unless you fix this. And unless you have a system where those employees can say, hey, that's a problem. I'm not just gonna try to solve it with this customer by you know, giving them an extra drink. I'm gonna go back to management and even better, I'm gonna go to a team of my coworkers and say, hey, you know, this customer was unhappy about this thing. And, and I've heard this from a few customers. What can we do about that to make it better? Or I was out visiting my family in some other city and I saw this really cool thing in a restaurant we ate at. Maybe we should try that. Imagine 
if all your employees, or at least 20% of them, let's just say, were listening to people, were looking for ideas, and were telling you what those were and had a way to implement them, how would that change the way your company performs? Yeah. This is something that comes up often on the show. It's this idea of every human being that we have on our team who is a part of our team is potential energy, is a new perspective, is a, a life of experiences and knowledge. And we right. don't into it. And it's a huge, like, if you just hire somebody to, to put the cheese on the bread and pass it to the next person, you're not tapping into the, the you know, the potential that they can bring, the perspective, the the, the ether, like tapping into the, what they call, if you're a fan of um, Napoleon Hill, like tapping into the ether, the, um, the well, got, maybe I'm not explaining this well, but you know what I'm saying? Like there's just yeah, so sure. much energy there. Um, so what you're saying is the companies that don't do ESOPs well, basically say, hey, this is what we're gonna be, but they don't actually tap into it. They don't walk the walk. They don't create a culture around this. They don't embrace it fully. Yeah. and. And to do this, a lot of companies, when they hear this, they say, well, Corey, we do that. You know, the, the characteristics of ownership culture are first, you share information with employees. You share information about how you're doing financially. You share information about the metrics of particular work processes. So, you know. I want to get into that, but I want to hold, because we're going to go through that whole list of the things you do. But I just want to emphasize the, the, the big thing that I pulled from your book is that it's not enough just to call yourself an ESOP or an employee-owned right. company. You can't just give people stock or a percentage. And you don't stop there. It has to go deeper. It has to yeah. be what you call participant or pr participative management, right? Where right. It's not you're not just a part of the, like you're a part of you're, you're, you're teaching people to think like owners and empowering them to think like owners. And if you don't walk the walk, if you don't create culture in, in routine, in speech, you know, all the stuff around this that make it echo every day, then it's not going to work. Exactly. Yeah. So we get now get into the key elements, which you list in the book of what the commonalities are, like what a successful employee owned operation does. And you, yeah. you start getting into it just before. I so, so you start off by sharing numbers. And you know, I was listening to a different podcast, Hidden Brain, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was about the gamification of things. Yes. And business is a great game. And there's a fabulous book called The Great Game of Business. Awesome book. And a website called The Great Game of Business that was created by a company in Springfield, Missouri, and 119 employees. They're a manufacturing company. And they were about to go out of business when they bought themselves from what was then International Harvester. And an ESOP bought about a third of the company and now it's 100% employee owned. And the CEO then, he's still the CEO, Jack Stack, he said, well, you know, we, we're leveraged 89 to one. We can't afford to lose $10,000. And so I'm going to teach every employee in this company about our income statement and our balance sheet. And he did. And they still do that. But I'm also going to teach every employee in the company about all those numbers that make up these numbers, all the metrics about throughput and, and turnover and errors and all the processes that they're operating in rebuilding truck engines, which is what they were doing at the time. And those employees will meet every week in a huddle for 30 minutes to go over the numbers and what they can do to make it better. And he said, this does two things. One is it gets people to focus on what's making money and losing money. All the day-to-day all the -day critical numbers of our operation. And in the restaurant industry, I know there's all kinds of those critical numbers about you know, inventory usage and table turnover and all those things that you want employees to understand. But here's the, so that's one critical insight is that they understand it, they're gonna be more likely to come up with suggestions about how to improve it. 
But the second really interesting in, uh, insight was, you know, I can get people to go from here to Reno on a bus for four hours and they can uh, push a little button and watch things spin around on a machine. And they're very happy most of the time and they've spent a lot of money that day and they've generally lost. But I couldn't get those people to go on a bus, do exactly the same thing all day and say, I'll give you $50 win or lose. All those casinos would shut down even though everybody would emerge a winner. Why? Because it's the game that's interesting. And business is that same game. And getting, it's, he says, you know, it's like a basketball game where the coach says, the numbers are too important and too complicated for me to share with you. So I want you to play the game. I want you to do really well, but I'm not gonna tell you the score because that's private. And I'm certainly not going to tell you things like the field goal percentage or the percentage of, of uh, shots we made from this distance, because those, those numbers you'd never understand, you wouldn't care about, and it's private anyway. That would be crazy. And it's crazy in business. Well, how'd they do? They now have 1,800 employees and their stock went from 10 cents to $650. So pretty well with the great game of business. Restaurants can do the same thing. So that's the first step. The second step is getting employees then to identify problems and solutions. And by the way, if somebody knows that the gas is leaking but doesn't know how to turn it off, the answer from the manager shouldn't be, if you don't have the solution to the problem, don't bother me with it. It's good to know the gas is leaking. If an employee doesn't have a solution to why the customer doesn't like the dish that they ordered that day, you still want to know that, even if the employee doesn't know what would make it better. Uh, so, but if you're going to do these things, if you're going to create opportunities for employees to identify problems and come up with solutions, you can't just permit it. An open door is not enough. Everybody has an open door policy you need a specific structure of employee involvement. And that's what that book, Beyond Engagement, is about, is it goes through lots of examples of companies and specifically talks about the structures that they use to get this. So it, at SRC, it's these weekly huddles of employees around the numbers that then provide opportunities for people to come up with ideas. At other companies, it might be, I have an idea, I submit an idea card, or I submit a problem card, and then that goes to a committee of employees, and they say, okay, that's interesting, let's form an ad hoc group to figure out what to do about this. So there's lots of different ways to do this, but it needs to be not just encouraged, not just permitted, it needs to be structured with specific systems of involvement. So I'm going to make sure I fully understand. The first thing is understanding the metrics, the game, right. how the game is played, what the numbers mean. So helping your people understand the game of business. The second element is making sure people feel seen as if they are a, a valuable part of the organization by offering right. solutions and letting them contribute to evolution of the business. Yeah. And it's, it, I want to emphasize that concept of structure. There has to be a system. One way to think about it is there has to be a system where employees on a regular basis can sit down and talk to one another about what's going on at work so using and then come up with solutions. Using restaurant lingo, I feel like this is the, the two times where this happens every day is the pre-meal when you get together. What And, and we saw this from uh, Hurt Schultze from Ritz Carlton, they go through the 26 standards of excellence every, you know, like, well, that's more cultural, but they, they go, I'm sure they go over the numbers too, where they're, they're talking about the numbers, how we did yesterday, what our goals are today, and then what can we do to, to do to reach those goals, right? And that happens every pre meal. And then there's the post, the, the, the post shift gathering of like, what happened today? Why did that happen? And like, what's the solution? So this never happens again. That's exactly the sort of thing. 
Awesome. And you make sure that happens every day. You block time for it. Yeah, that that is one terrific way to think about uh, a structure that would work. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, what else? Because I know there's a few more things you mentioned in the book as far as what you need to do to make sure this works. Well, if you do those, if you share enough ownership so it's meaningful to people financially and you do these cultural things we just talked about, of course, then finally also want to make sure people understand what they're getting through ownership, how it works, because most people have no experience with stock, much less stock in a closely held company. I still have a lot to learn. Some of yeah. these words were in me today. I was like, so, so you need to explain it to people. It is, it is not, it seems complicated, but the core concepts aren't that difficult. And one of the good things about this field is you don't need to be reinventing any wheels. The, the recipes, if you will, are already available. You know, it's, you don't need to, to, to use the analogy, you don't need to learn to cook all these things. There's cookbooks and <clears throat> there's cookbooks for employee ownership culture and communication and technical issues. So the, the it's a field that's very open to sharing companies love to talk to other companies about what, what one of the one of the companies that gets a lot of visitors from new employee ownership companies for instance is harpoon brewery in the northeast they have a restaurant too and they're, uh, they're employee owned and they're really good at at ownership culture and so people come to harpoon to learn about their culture and not coincidentally to have some of their famous beer. Yeah. So there, there was one more element that you dropped in the book that um, I don't know if it came out, it, it did come out, but I just want to kind of make sure it's obvious is that you need to interweave this idea of, of employee ownership into the fabrics of your culture and your brand. It needs to be. Yeah everywhere and echoed constantly so some of the things you, you use um uh night oh, what red uh what's the flower company i'm i'm, I'm drawing a blank there's two actually king arthur and now Bob, and bob's red mill yeah so you, you mentioned king arthur in the book and the the things that they do rituals to reinforce this idea of of employee owned uh they they you see companies that put the 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 words employee owned in the title of their business oh yeah it, it, you can't just say we're this and then never look to it again. You have to literally make it echo, put things on the walls, like make it known, make it echo, make sure that people know this is, this is a part of our identity. Make it a part of your culture. Yes. I, I, I'm sure that some of the people listening to this use King Arthur flower or maybe Bob's red mill, uh, but King Arthur's, uh, you know, they, they do a lot of sales to bakeries and restaurants because it's really high quality flower but they're they very much are very upfront about being an employee-owned company it's on everything same thing with bob's on everything you see from them it says 100 percent employee owned and that's good for the employees to get reminded of that but it's also the research shows that there is a really strong customer preference for employee-owned companies. Conscious capital. There are people who will go to an employee-owned restaurant because it's employee-owned and they feel better about that. Uh, so it, if, if you are employee-owned, by all means, let people know. You know, here in the Bay Area, Zachary's Pizza is a, an employee-owned company and Zachary's is a really iconic pizza place here. And uh, it says every, every Zachary's an employee owned company. And they probably didn't need the extra help, but that, that's gotten them even more business. So, I mean, I think the big takeaway when it comes to culture, and if you are going to do an employee owned organization, you can't just say, hey, guys, just so you know, we're an employee owned culture, you're going to get stock options and percentage of profit or whatever it really has to be your north star it has to be the thing that we're all here to be partners together to be the best we're in this it's us you know this is yeah 
And, and it's interesting in the pandemic, and we saw a company like Newport Harbor, which is a hundred percent employee owned company, they own 16 restaurants in I think now Florida, but mostly in uh, New England. And they're, they're a very famous group of restaurants and a lot of their, uh, a lot of their restaurants are very high end and very well known. What was this restaurant group? Newport Harbor group. You're giving me homework. And, I love it. Yeah. Uh, and they're a pretty big company now. I think they have over a thousand employees. But of course, as with many restaurants, the pandemic was a challenging time. And they really made a sustained effort to keep as many people on the payroll as they could because it was part of what they're about being an employee on a company. And I think they built a lot of, of good customer will based on that. Their customers appreciated what they were doing. They got involved in a lot of community things. Uh, and I think they'll come out of that really a stronger company. Yeah. Corey, I've really loved today's conversation. I want to start thinking about wrapping it up. Um, I'm curious, you wrote this book back, it was published in 2005. So we're going back almost, uh, almost 20 years, 18, 17 years ago. What's changed, if anything, or, or another way to look at this is like, what's the future of employee owned? Well, I think a lot of what we wrote about then is, is still true. Uh, and employee ownership has grown in various ways. It's not grown as fast as we'd like, but it's a significant part of the economy. There's there's now 14 million employee owners through just through ESOPs and about another 10 million through other kinds of employee ownership plans. So that's a big chunk of the economy. ESOPs have about 1.5 trillion, trillion, the T, dollars in assets. And we're also now, we're more optimistic about the future of this idea than we've ever been. It looks like Canada is going to adopt legislation similar to ours. Uh, there's interest in a variety of other countries. The UK already has legislation similar to ours. There's uh, money coming now from the CARES Act that will be helping to finance employee ownership. There's potential improvements in legislation for employee ownership. There's many cities around the country that are setting up outreach programs to encourage employee ownership. So it's an idea, I think, that's really gaining a lot of traction with both with business people, uh, but also with policymakers and pundits. So we think we may be on the cusp of, uh, of something really important with this. You never know, and maybe we're just being optimistic, but the country and indeed most of the world is desperate for some way to make capitalism work because even its most ardent defenders are saying capitalism really is at risk right now because if it if people stop believing it's fair to them whether that's on the right or the left and you're seeing it from both sides this perception that, it, that, that, that life is just unfair. We can already see that around the world uh, becomes a real threat to both democracy and capitalism. So we need to find solutions that, that sustain what works about capitalism and make it more fair. And I will, and I'll, I don't identify as left or right. I don't really identify with any, I don't have a home. I don't really have a party. There's no nothing that really excites me in any of the options that are out there right now, but I do have an issue with the left side that identify as left and that echo that same sentiment that capitalism is broken. My, my, my issue with that is when you say something is broken or if it doesn't work, it, then your brain shuts off and you stop looking for solutions to make it work. Right. And that, what you're doing is you're trying to find solutions to make it work. And I, and I do believe in capitalism. I believe in conscious capitalism. And I think that we're constantly should be evolving in, in finding ways to make it work. Because I mean, it's not like it's been a complete disaster. Am I right? Like, oh, absolutely. Capitalism is, has provided enormous benefit. People overall, even poor people are better off because of capitalism than any other alternative that's come up so far. 
Could it be better? But it could be a whole lot better. It could be a whole lot fairer. And it could be done in a way that the, the issue with, for instance, the way the left sometimes approaches the problem, and, and I'm not making a judgment on this, but the people on the other side say, well, the left approaches a problem by taking money away from the rich to give to the people who aren't. Whatever you think of that, there's practical limits on how much of that you can do, uh, both economically and politically. And the people on the right say, well, these problems with uh, wealth insecurity and inequality, they're just the price you pay for an efficient capitalist system. There's nothing we can do. Neither of those is an acceptable solution to me when there is a way that we can make both sides happy. Uh, we don't take any money away from the people who already have it under employee ownership. In fact, they're going to come out better off. But we're sharing some of the future growth with the people who help create it. And to me, that's Goldilocks land. Yeah, this I works. Love it. It's a it. practical, politically appealing solution. Yeah. And I do you want to take this opportunity. Um, and I think that's a great way to kind of summarize today's conversation and leave some hope on the table, right? Um, but I do want to give you an opportunity to, uh, before we answer some questions, to, to tell us what your next book is. You have Ownership, uh, The Reinvention of Companies, Capitalism, and Who Owns It. Is that going to be the right. official that, title? That's the tentative title. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Book publishing, is in, in especially with our publisher, who's uh, published a lot of very successful uh, business books, there's a lot of players involved in all sorts of you know, marketing and yeah. jacket covers and titles. And There's going to be a book coming out in about a year. Let's just yes, say. it'll have a title like that. Yeah. And uh, I'm writing it again with my co-author, John Case, who's a business writer, and the the premise of the book is we need to we need to look at different ways that ownership can be shared that are practical. And employee ownership comes up as the most practical idea, but there are other ways. So for instance, an interesting concept is in New York, there's in, instead of getting an Uber, you can go to the New York taxi co-op. So it's New York, sorry, New York Drivers Cooperative. So they said, well, rather than having Lyft or Uber own the software and all the money and everybody else making basically nothing working for them, why don't we create our own software to find people rides and we'll own it? Yes. Yes. This is what I'm excited about because I think I know people are guilty of being linear thinkers. They think about what we have right now in this moment, and they project the future based off of what is here right. and present. But the world's exponentially changing. Uh, Technology is improving. DIY communities are evolving. Open source API is coming on scene. And there's gonna, the future is going to be very different. It's going to be very more dynamic. There's going to be a ton of opportunity, which is why I think we're moving in this direction of ownership, a, a community of ownership, because... We're going to be able to automate. We don't need employees. The idea of the employee is going to be replaced with automation and, and computers and, tech and digital world. Like that's the future. And I mean, what, what's people going on? may just be doing different things. Yeah. Well, than let's that we can't imagine now. Yeah. There's but, all uh, sorts of work that needs to be done in the world, I guess is the, I would, the premise. I would love to have you back when you guys are closer to, to find uh, finalizing the title of the, of the book so we can promote it officially. And I would love to dive deeper. And I think this is kind of the stuff that we we're talking about earlier with co-ops and LLC. Um, what was it? Uh, the uh, LLC, you, you named it. Um, Synthetic equity. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Um, th is that kind of stuff more the topic of this book? Well, the, the book looks at other things like what are called these platform co-ops where instead of the Uber, the you know investors owning Uber or Lyft or whatever, the the people who work for that platform, the drivers, the I'll the cleaners, you know the house cleaners, the whatever, those people own the software that assigns these things. There's sovereign wealth funds. The you know, Alaska has one of these where 
the state sends a check to everybody every year based on oil revenue on that came from state land. Um, Corey, you just made a new friend, man. I want to be your friend. I want to dive deeper into this stuff. You have my interest, and I would love to have you back on the show. Maybe next to time. Do it. Person. <laughs> so, uh, real quick, uh, before we say goodbye, I just want—I do want to open up for some of the folks who joined us today. Are there any questions that you have, Bob? I, I saw your hand up go er early on the conversation. Uh, now is your time to unmute your mic and to ask your question. Um, go for it. Uh, and most of the most of the first of all, the webinar is very informative. Um, the, the, the application for an ESOP to a restaurant is cumbersome at best. Um, how many restaurant groups do you know of, Corey, that have adopted this? You're right. There's fewer in the restaurant industry than in other industries. Okay. relatively speaking, there's probably 15 or 20 restaurants okay. that are doing this right um, now. One of, one of the criteria that you talked about is having enough profitability. To that's that's it. right. That's a lot of the reason there's a lot of and restaurants. It goes back yeah. when I talk about it, what, every day, Eric, that their business models are antiquated and they're running yeah. at five to eight percent and blah, blah, blah. And I, I proposed to Corey that if you wanted a hybrid condition of ownership that incentivizes the employees, then you need to take a look at a strict revenue share model. And I, I don't disagree with you. That there, I think that's an alternative that people should look at. I think an ESOP probably for the restaurants who meet those criteria is something that they really should look at where they're looking at business transition. Um, I would say for companies who aren't looking for a transition, that that sort of revenue sharing may be a more practical step to take uh, right now. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't cost $100,000. That's right. It doesn't cost any, and, well, and, it costs very it does, little to set and, it up. And it does the same thing. Uh, uh, I wrote a white paper in 1998 about no tipping in America. The, the, the business nature or the business models of restaurants need to change dramatically yeah. in order to adopt to the future of, of, of what's going on here. Uh, if they think they're going to continue the 1905 model, they're going to die. Uh, yeah. They're going to they're lose their employees to Amazon and somebody else. Uh, I think you're right. It, it's, it's already, you're already seeing it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and the profitabilities are... I mean, I've spent the last 24 years taking guys from eight, nine, and 10% to 20s. And they were amazed at what could be done without changing the model too much. Uh, but most of them are very, very static in their approach. They don't want to relearn their business. And, you know, when you start telling them that they have to go to, to become an S Corp or C Corp, and they have to spend $100,000. And that, I mean, it's, it's, it's just not in their DNA. Uh, there, there are other models. I mean, I call it the Kaizen model and I sent you my email to maybe have a discussion on a private basis about what that looks like. Uh, but I know that there's other al alternatives to the industry and as excited as Eric gets about ESOPs, uh, him and I probably have to spend some time on a Kaizen model. I can get him more excited. I'll be, I'll be honest. When I, when I first started this, this journey into ESOPs, I was more enthusiastic after having this conversation. I'm a little de deflated because of how out of, well, they're like, yeah, they left out the part about the hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> but we did dive into some of the other options, co-ops and um, LLC on synthetic equity. Is that, did I get it right that time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I want to, Robert, I think you're absolutely right. I think for a very high percentage of the restaurant industry, employee ownership may not be the way they want to go. And there are alternative ways of sharing the, the wealth that uh, that make a lot of sense for their employees and their situation. So this is not a, a magic bullet by any means for restaurants. No, it's it, it's not. But when, when when you take a look at the model that I'm that I'm proposing, uh, 
it, it's a general, you get all kinds of additional side benefits. Number one is the more you sell, the more you make. Yeah, absolutely. Number two. And, and it's not incompatible with employee ownership. I think that for those listeners, that if you're in a situation where you're looking to do a transition, if you're big enough and profitable enough, an ESOP like for Johnny's Pizza is really something you should take a look at. If you're not at that stage, then these other alternatives that we talked about and that you're talking about, Robert, really are where your focus should be. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I plan on going deeper into that, but I do think that there is some relevancy here for some folks that might be, you know, scaling in, in the next five years and might be able to reach the goals of becoming an ESOP, like a Johnny's Pizza uh, or like a Harpoon Brewery that are bigger operations. I think that this is definitely, a, it was, it's a definitely a target, right? Uh, for some people who are listening today, but I do absolutely want to get you back or somebody else back to go into co-ops much more deeper into this, uh, this rendition of LLC's uh, synthetic equity. Sounds really Corey, interesting. Corey, are you familiar with the uh, restaurant group in New York called uh, Colors? Uh, familiar is too strong a term, but I've read a little bit about them. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're a co-op. They're a co-op. Employ- yeah. yeah. They're a co-op employee based, uh, and made up of people that were actually sitting in windows on the world. Right. Playing right. And, you know, they've struggled. They really have. Yeah. The, the, the iconic ESOP restaurant in New York is Grand Central Oyster Bar. Yeah. Right. That's true. That's true. I do want to respect Corey's time. We're at an hour and a half of recording now, um, more than I had expected. Thank you so much, Corey. For... Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. I don't see any other hands going up, so I'm assuming all the questions are out. Uh, and I just can't say thank you enough. How can we connect with you if we want to learn more or if we want to pursue this? So, again, my name is Corey Rosen, R-O-S-E-N. It's the National Center for Employee Ownership. You can Google us at nceo.org, um, of course, on LinkedIn as well. But the easiest way is just to reach out to me directly uh, at nceo.org. My email is c-r-o-s-e-n at nceo.org. And I'd be more than happy to contact you, or, or you can just give me a call. Our phone number is on our website. Beautiful. And I do look forward to getting you back on the show. Thank you so much. There is no questioning, my man. You are unstoppable. All right. Thank you. Thank you.